Good morning, everyone. We're back at the Veterans One Stop with Delissa, and she's going to let you know something's going on today very special here. Excellent. Hey, welcome, everybody. It's December 7th, and a tradition we've started here at the Veterans One Stop on December 7th every year, we like to honor those that served during World War II and to remember those that we lost. So today is a very special day. We invite veterans that live in this area to come and to tell their stories, and we ask students who might like to know these stories to come and ask. So... We welcome you, and if you have any questions that you might want to uh, give to our veterans, we get, we welcome you to uh, text those in. Yes, we encourage you to ask questions live to these World War II veterans. especially those in harm's way. But Father, on this day, we remember especially those who lost their lives at Pearl Harbor and in the ensuing World War. And we pause to give thanks to you for those who are here this morning that we honor and appreciate. Father, we consider the sacrifices of all those who have gone before us, and we ask that you would grant your comfort and peace today to those who have uh, experience loss to those who have given their all. Thank you for this generation that is here today. May we all be servants like them. For we ask these things in the name of our Lord, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 All right, well, we started this as a tradition. I believe that we had our first one two years ago when we first got opened up. 
Uh, we see some of our, our familiar faces, and what's always exciting is when we have new faces. And so we have some new faces and everything today. And so I would like to start with our new face. Um, I'd like to introduce Miss Ann, and I'm, and I'm going to read a little bit about her. And so you'll know a little bit about her, and we'll know uh, some uh, about our, our other best, and then we'll open it up just that you can ask them questions. And uh, we welcome Mr. Livingstone and your group that's come in, and uh, some of our high school students to ask some questions. So let me just tell you a little bit about Miss Ann over here. She says, to most people, I am just Ann. I was born on December 4th, 1920 in Tyler, Texas, to L.D. Carrington III of Austin and Lorraine Russell of Winsboro. Great last name, I must say, Russell. I am a fifth generation Texan and members of my family have been in every war since the American Revolution. Looking back over my life, uniforms have been a huge part of my life. For example, I was a Girl Scout, a high school cheerleader, a college majorette, I wore a cap and gown for graduation, I was a security guard at the Army Air Depot in San Bernardino, California, and the U.S. Army Air Corps. While in the Air Corps one, I had several jobs, military police, driving a huge truck, driving an officer, and my favorite, working on the flight line. I logged air hours on each plane and I even got to take test flights. I married a man in uniform. He was, transferred to, he was transferred to one base and I to another. And when I found out that we were going to have a child, I was discharged. I joined him in Illinois until he was reassigned to California and then overseas, where we stayed with my parents in Waco until our daughter was born and he was deployed. The next 34 years, I was a teacher and a counselor for Waco ISD. No uniforms. However, <laughs> That problem was solved because I joined the American Legion Post 440, then later Post 121, and I wore a cap to meetings. I have probably been a member of the American Legion for 56 years. A few years before retiring, I married Samuel E. and is it this year? This year. This year, Jr. He was the commander of Post 440, and he was a man in uniform, too. After he retired from the Waco, uh, veterans BAMC. He worked as a bailiff in Judge Loeb's McLennan County Court. We volunteered. My uniform was a blue smock. My service pen shows 1,500 hours. I have to say that Sam was the smartest, kindest, and most loving man I have ever known, and it was my joy and happiness to be his friend and wife for 29 years, and he died in April of 2005. I've worn several caps in the American Legion, and I've been an officer in the Post, District, Division, and four years Chairman of Membership and Organization Commission for the Texas, the Department of Texas. Caps are uniforms. During these years, I've met many dedicated, fine, and loyal Legionnaires and their families. God bless you and your family and the USA. Welcome, Miss Ann, for Thank your you. first visit to the yes. Veterans One. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but do you know that on the way, that before she let anybody take her to the doctor, what Miss Mangum did? She said she wasn't going to go until she got to deliver her sandwiches. <laughs> so we're glad she's good pay and everything. But that just shows the dedication that she has to the veterans and the veterans one stop. So Mr. Russell Cleaver, we just met, and, and my husband gives me a hard time that we can't even go out to eat in a restaurant because if anybody even looks like a veteran, I wind up hanging out at their table more than I do my own. <laughs> Mr. Cleaver and everything and I met, and he told me that he was a cook during World War II. And you still have that recipe? Yeah. Can I see what you... Why don't you tell them what goes into well, it? You, okay. you're free to a no, I, I think. Yeah, that's your show. Okay. <laughs> Can you read it? This is how you make hot cakes for 120 men. Oh. You start with 40 eggs, three dips of sugar, three dippers of sugar, he says. You add 10 cans of milk, 18 vanilla tablets. Because you're overseas. How much flour? You just said throw it. And mix it till it's. <laughs> Just throw it in there? That's true. <laughs> so then in the morning, or what is this? At? This is at night. Oh, you do all that at night. And, and then in the, the morning, morning, you add the milk and the flour and a, one and a half cans of baking powder. True. And that's how you make pancakes for 120 <laughs> men. So make sure Miss Janice gets this and she does it. She, does it every, every, she, makes, she makes pancakes here every Wednesday morning, if you didn't know that. She makes pancakes for every Wednesday morning along with her biscuits, so make sure you share that with her, okay? <laughs> All right, Mr. Walton. Mr. Walton is a, fair, a celebrity in his own right here because he didn't just serve during World War II, he also served during Korea and Vietnam. So it's not very often you get someone that got all three, and so we're so excited that Mr. Walton's here, and he's got plenty of the stories to tell. And last but not least, Miss Wheezy. Now, when I first got here, they said that it wasn't Monday if you didn't see her. And that's how we start our week. Every week here at the Veterans One Stop, you can see that, that there are cupcakes that are brought and that she brings, that she bakes them on Sunday. And Monday morning. And Monday morning. Nice on Monday morning. <laughs> and that's how we start our week at the Veterans One Stop. And so there are pictures back there, and for those of y'all that ever went to the original One Stop over on Austin Avenue, um, that's how we started getting uh, treats and sweets mm -hmm. along with Miss Mangum's uh, uh, pimento cheese sandwiches. You know, uh, the way that somebody's heart's always through their stomach around here. So these ladies uh, have really contributed to that. So these are our special guests for today, and we welcome them. And just so you know that the uh, we have four of the students from the World War II class at Vanguard that are here. It's a semester-long elective class that they've chosen to be a part of, and over the course of the semester, we uh, we study World War II. And uh, so we actually uh, go through asking questions and finding and thanking vets throughout the semester, uh, and really for the for for life now. And uh, these students, uh, once they thank fifty veterans they get a vial of sand from Iwo Jima oh, wow. uh, excuse me from, from from Omaha Beach and whoever gets the most gets a vial of sand from uh, Iwo Jima as well so uh, so anyway well I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to the students they uh, they know how to ask questions and <laughs> students again uh, as you already know make sure you're speaking as loud or louder than I am. And who's got the first question for our panel? And you might want to go ahead and come on up so they can hear you. Know you know what, yeah, let's move to that table right up there. <coughs> and then if somebody chimes in with some questions a lot from Facebook Live, you let us know and everything as well. We'll let you know. Cool, yeah. okay. So my question 
question is how did you feel when you first heard that Pearl Harbor was attacked? I don't know, like, I'm gonna get over here so I can whisper in this Devastated. How did you feel when you first heard that Pearl Harbor was attacked? I don't know why I was just a kid and didn't pay any attention to it. <laughs> the communication was very bad. There was no radio, no TV, so news about the war was very few in, in between. So it was a, just a natural part of our life that it was something we had to contend with and then fight for. How did you feel? We, we had a radio at my my home, and this was unusual because we were very poor. And one of the rules of the family was we couldn't use the radio during the day because it would run the electric bill up, and my mother and father was at work, and, and we would sneak and turn the radio on, and we turned the radio on and, and heard about the attack of Pearl Harbor. I was about 18 years old and I was attending Paul Quinn, which was a little college in East Waco. And that Monday morning after the, the news came out about Pearl Harbor, uh, President Roosevelt made the speech declaring war. And we were walking down the street and some lady had her radio on. The street in East Waco was Rennick Street. And she had her radio in sitting in the window and we walked up into her yard and stood up beside the house and listened to the president declare war on, the, on Japan. I guess I should have told you that I was in a dormitory at college at that time, junior. And we had the radio on, they broke in, started telling the news about it, and we were just appalled. I mean, everybody at that particular time had been hurt in that thing. We just all got together and it was like, it was like the world was coming to an end for us, and we were scared. My dad was a veteran of mm -hmm. World War One, mm -hmm. and uh, the day after, Monday after Pearl Harbor, he went down to the Marine Corps recruiting office and uh, tried to re-enlist, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't take him. They said because he had false teeth. My dad said, I don't want to eat them, I just want to kill them. Miss <laughs> 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 Wheezy, you didn't get a chance. Would you like to answer the question? Sure, what, uh, about the... I really don't uh, remember too much about it other than it was in the paper. We, mm -hmm. we did have the newspaper. And then uh, shortly after that, I discovered that my uncle had been there. And he was asleep when it happened. Mm -hmm. And right in the World War II, uh, he was in several of the battles. Well, thank you. Kylie, do you have a question? Yes. So what would be one of your most interesting stories to tell about your experience? Miss Ann, you want to start with that one? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the most interesting? Mm -hmm. I guess the most organized part, which I like organization, mm -hmm. is basic. I mean, we, they whip the whip out us, you know. We, they kept us going and uh, had to be in the prison. If it's at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, where they're my basic, and um, they had German prisoners there. And as we marched, we never walked anywhere. We always had to be in formation. Mm -hmm. And every step, right where it's supposed to be, instead of somebody being on the left when we were all on the right, we passed by these prisoners, and they said, Don't you dare look over at them. Don't you turn your head and look at them. But as we walked by them, we'd do our ties like that. <laughs> Oh, they were tall and handsome young men. They must have been some of the first that were killed. But then the most interesting thing when I was that, that I did in the military was when I was um, 
put on the flight line mm -hmm. and I was logging the air miles of each plane. It was a twin engine uh, uh, forward thing at that time, Air Force Base. And that was interesting. And uh, we logged those planes and know when to call them in and when the pilots would tell us that something was not right for them. And, and that was probably the most interesting thing. But the what funniest thing is when I get to, when I wouldn't be working, I could go up on test hops because they had to test out an engine or a landing gear or whatever. And I always like to take them there. I mean, it, it, I, I'm a very inquisitive person, and I don't want somebody to tell me about it. I want to do it. So, first time I went up, and I've always been subject to uh, motion sickness, even in the back seat of a car. But I didn't give it another thought. I thought, oh no, you know, I'm, I'm good. So I'm very arrogant, independent, <laughs> stubborn. That's me. And still, to the point. And so he took me up and he said, we're, we're going to test this engine and um, it's going to be okay. He took that plane up. Dear ones, he did everything. He did flips, he did swings, he did this, he did that. Off came my military cap, and you know what it was used for. That's when I was a, day, a kid, I'd always have to have a pan in the back seat with crackers in case I got sick in my stomach. Oh, that, that did it. I said, never again. And when I say never again on something, you can kind of believe I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so this guy, he was, he was a test pilot, and I was off duty. He saw me go up and around the post, and he said, we're going to take a test off. You want to go? Uh, no. The last time I was up, I got sick, and I don't want and I stayed sick for nearly three days. I don't know, <laughs> right for three days. I don't want to do that. I promise you. I said, okay. How much you promise me? I'll give you forty dollars if I don't do it. Good. In a private plane, that was like money. <laughs> so anyway, we um, we went up. It was an engine, another engine one, and he said, now we're gonna get up. I think it was 10,000 feet up, and we're gonna, I don't remember what it was, but we're gonna cut the motor off and check out the motor. You know, that was the most peaceful. We were up there, see nothing but sky, I didn't wanna look down. And it was just like, I was in heaven. I mean, there was no sound. You couldn't hear anything. The motor wasn't making any noise. All of a sudden, that motor, that plane was like a piece of tin. It started rattling and rattling and rattling, and I thought, oh no, oh no, is this fun? <laughs> he said, don't worry, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to turn the motor. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, he said, you, we, we may have to bail out. I said, uh-uh. <laughs> I got that parachute, but I'm not bailing out of this plane for anything. You're going to take it down. I'm not, you're just going to take it down. <laughs> well, pretty soon the motor came on and we made a perfect landing. Now, one other time, you know, I'm, I guess I'm an idiot for punishment. But another time I went up, and this was going to be for propellers. Mm -hmm. They had to put a new propeller on it. In fact, when I was in San Bernardino, uh, Army Depot, I was a security guard and I did three uh, shifts in the big building that held nothing but propellers. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he went back to that and he said, we're going to test out this propeller. And uh, no, it wasn't a propeller, I'm sorry, it was a landing gear. It was a landing gear. Because we were coming in for a, for a landing and only one of the wheels came down. The other didn't come down. The other he said, well, I, that's okay. It's, it's not coming down automatically. We'll just turn this little lever here and just crank that little wheel down. It'll crank, it'll crank, it'll crank, and all that little thing that you see up there, it wasn't going anywhere. He said, okay, I'm going to, by that time, he had notified the landing people and we had, as we went around, went around, there was the ambulance, there was the fire truck. <laughs> I told the Lord then, now this is the truth, if I get down and I'm still alive, I'll never in my born days 
ever get up in an airplane again. <laughs> now, I was about 21 then, and I'm 97, 98 now, and I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> physical exam and then you would get a written exam the next day and I made a high grade on the, the middle exam and <clears throat> and was transferred to the Army Air Corps and for possibly going to flight training at uh, Tuskegee and <clears throat> we had different evaluations when we I was I was sent to, to Peace Love uh, Air Corps in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. And there we were given some additional testing. And, <clears throat> and we, I, I passed another written exam and, and the physical. And I got to the, the summarizing officer, which summarized <coughs> after he had gone through all of the stages. And he said, maybe that's something we physically, we might have missed that a problem you have to say, do you know of anything? And, and, and I, I was a young fellow and I was, a, I was afraid and I, I, I know the military is very strict. And, 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 I, and I would have hay fever twice a year around here in Waco. And I thought I better tell them because if they catch me later, then I would get some severe punishment. And I told the officer that that I, I had hate people. And and he had he had my medical papers, which I had passed all of that again. And and he took his red pencil and put a big red X on on my paper. And that eliminated me from further consideration for for airplane pilot and I, I took basic training after that and I was stationed at uh, sent to uh, uh, air base in southern Illinois called George Field and uh, my, my brother was was fighting in North Africa his unit he was in the infantry and he's fighting in North Africa and I decided that I wanted to do something which was to contribute more to the war effort. And I, and I put in to get a transfer from the Air Corps. And, and I was reassigned to the infantry. And, and, and that, that was a bit of a difference. <laughs> I had a little office and I was the, the clerk in the supply room in the Air Corps in the unit I was in. And now I'm in the infantry and I'm in a, sleeping in a pup tent, walking in the mud, full field pack. And I was put in the L Company 372nd Infantry Regiment and I survived and became the number one machine gunner in the, in the outfit. So, and after a while, I was I was happy to be in the uh, infantry. Mr. Klebert, I bet you you guys something besides a pancake recipe you can share. Do you have a story you want to tell? 
Too many, I guess. <laughs> well, I went to the service and basically I'm from Louisiana and I was drafted, went to Fort Chaffee, and then to Fort Raleigh, and I took my training in Fort Raleigh, Kansas. Um, one aspect of it that I'm proud of, uh, we were one of the last people, men, to train in the cavalry. So, um, one of my experience with the horses was that you pulled down a 50 millimeter gun, somebody carried the tripod, somebody carried the barrel and the ammo. And the next maneuver was that we needed to go down a hill 300 feet down. And I said, uh uh, I'm not gonna go down that. No way. <laughs> so I was scared. And the sergeant came up to me, you are gonna go down or else. So I finally made up my mind, brave enough to go down the hill. And the horse knew more about this than I did. <laughs> so he would zigzag. So he wouldn't fall over. And he would zigzag that way. And by the time we got to the very bottom, my saddle and me was on top of his neck. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very uh, experience that I wasn't prepared for. And the next thing, I was shipped to um, Santa Ana, California. And on the train, there was no AC, nothing. And we passed through tunnel, and the engine was fired by coal. Therefore, you had soup, you know. The, and it would come out, and we were all like brown and black or whatever. And we took down the seats so we could lay down on the floor. And my next experience was go overseas. And somebody mentioned about being sick. It took us 30 days to cross the Pacific. And I think I was sick 20 days. <laughs> if anybody ever knew about, you know, even dry, that was it, right? <laughs> and, and it was terrible, so. My whole trip I spent on top at the peril of being washed off the ship that I was so sick that I couldn't exist. And the only thing I ate was the raw potatoes on top of the ship. <laughs> and finally we got to Langan Beach. And no one geographic flow is that you sailing from east to west, and I thought I'd landed in the part of the Philippines on the East Coast. And when I got discharged, I looked up, we landed on the West Coast in the Gain Beach, which is the island of Luzon. And uh, my final duty was the occupation of Japan. The only thing I can remember about all my experiences <coughs> is the look of veterans from Guadalcanal Speaking of, of beaches, I'd like to and, know. And it was an experience that these people did not care because they had been in battle for so much. And my next experience was that when I went to Japan, we were one of the first troops, and I could see the, the Japanese on the side. Like they were beat, like they were a uh, hang look down. And it was something I'll never forget. Anyway, a lot more story, but I'm through. Thank you. Miss Weezy, you were going to say something? Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to interrupt. I thought he was through. <clears throat> My husband was a Coast Guardsman, and he was <coughs> one of those that were trained to drive the Higgins boat. Those of you that are interested in World War II, you might look into that. Because I would, we were stationed in New Orleans, and I would 
go out to the canal and watch the men trying to get the God to heal. So I thought that would be a little very interesting thing to ask. Students, next question. What's the life? What's the living experience doing the battle? Like, have you ever slept in a fox foxhole before, or like, how, what did you eat during the battle? I was never in the battle, <laughs> so but, uh, my experience on my training was was such mm -hmm. I can remember in a assimilated foxhole in Kansas that I went to sleep. The next thing I knew, who wicked you up? So it's, uh, it's a very experience that uh, you have to be aware of. <coughs> well, you know, you after the war, hole? you want to forget everything. So no. many no. things are not so vividly in my mind as to what actually happened because we don't want to remember. Um, and to be frank with you, I, I couldn't wait to take my uniform off. I thought it was something that was unique to being in the service. But I'm a preacher, by the way. And people sometimes, they ignore the fact of all of us that when we were called, there was no protest. There was, a matter of fact, to go in. That's part of your duty as a citizen of the United States. The greatest nation, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that disturbs me that uh, when you have to, have to do something, you do it. Mm -hmm. And you're brought up that way. And that's what I, what I said. I didn't have a radio when we heard that, but it, it was a living life that all of us didn't have, right? No I, electricity. We had a fireplace. It was kerosene lamps. <laughs> <laughs> but we enjoyed ourselves. We were within a family group, within friends, right? And we didn't think about going on a plane or sightseeing or a road trip. We were content. So I think that's the big difference in our experience in World War II than now. We seek in, I guess, uh, excitement and thrills in, in such a way that it doesn't last very long. It's a split second, mm -hmm. and you have to grasp it. Otherwise, it's gone. True. Mm -hmm. So, in our day, it lasted longer than that. So, yeah, enough said. Tom, you got any, a story you want to tell? No. No tell? <laughs> <laughs> he's never shy until he's like uh, up here in the front of the thing, and then he's always got a story to tell. Not, not even one? No. Right. They don't want to hear what I've got to tell. Yeah, they don't want to hear. Tell them a story. I, n I never slept in a foxhole. I slept in a bed at night. <laughs> <laughs> we were always in camp, and at night we were, we were in, in the beds. And I, I know about those foxholes because it, Sometimes they pull some of the air cores out and put them in the infantry, especially in the battles of the bulge. They pulled a lot of a lot of the boys out of the air corps and put in that one. But I was lucky; I I, I got to stay with the air corps and the army. How old are you, Mr. McNamara? Pardon? How old are you? <laughs> I'm ninety-five. He's 95. I think he's the, is he the youngest up here? I'm the youngest. No. You're the youngest? 92. Well, girls, we don't ever ask. <laughs> 98. <laughs> and Miss Ann just celebrated her birthday this week. So, Tuesday, oh, right? You. Happy at 96. Oh, yeah. two birthdays this week. 96. 
<laughs> How about any other questions from anybody out there? And in answer to a question that was asked a moment ago, I didn't go overseas. Uh, I think she read that I had married when I was in Oklahoma. And uh, he went one place and I went to the other. And after a couple of months, I realized that I was going to have a baby and that you just can't. At that time, we couldn't, a woman couldn't stay in the military. So I had to have an honorable discharge and got $300 to leave the post and go home. And before I went up to Illinois, where my husband was. And, uh, but I never saw, we were on, yeah, it's Santa Monica. We were, we were on, we were sent there to be going overseas to go to the European theater because the European theater was just about over then. Mm -hmm. That's why we were put down on the flight line because they sent those boys over there to the European theater because it was pretty safe for them to be doing what they were doing that we were placed in. I guess that's about all. <laughs> I do have a, a quick question. Uh, typically, we, we end the class uh, with our World War II veterans with this question. Where were you when you heard that the war was over and what are your thoughts on the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan? Should, should we have done that? So where were you when you heard the war was over yes. and should we or should we not have ever dropped the atomic bombs? Do you hear the question? Where were you when you heard the war was over and do you think was, that we should have dropped a bomb? I was in England and I think the atomic bomb was the greatest thing we ever had. Because they were yes. getting ready to ship us right on to the Pacific. Having been a daughter of a veteran, I've veteranized everything all my life. But uh, the, the thing we needed to do was to support, and we saved our. Uh, what was it? Not aluminum, but anyway, the metal wrapping on our candy bars, and we picked up all kinds of uh, metal that might be laying around and turned it in, and we turned in, uh, we, we did everything we could as young people to support our veterans. Now, my husband was a corpsman in the Marine Corps, and he was in on Okinawa. And as a corpsman, he, you know what they do. A few years after we were married and had children, he was in Tyler, Texas, in the bus station. He worked for Greyhound. And he started to walk over to the, to the uh, bus and somebody hollered, hey, Tex. And he turned around and there stood a man that he had treated on Okinawa. He had, he had, the man had had his guts laying all over the place and he grabbed them and stuck them back in the cavity and pinned it together with safety pins and sent him to the, to the field hospital never expecting him to really live. And he came home, my husband came home on the bus and he was still pale as a ghost because he never thought that man he had helped on Okinawa could have lived. What are your thoughts on the atomic bomb? I've had different thoughts about that. Uh, I realized that that was the beginning of a different type of war from here on out. Mm -hmm. I knew that there'd be worse things than that, which there are now. It's, it's not a, 
Lord, my floors have been from the biblical times. Uh, it's more machinery involved in that. And from a humane standpoint, what do you do? Get revenge and do more than what they did to us? Uh, it's a hard to answer a question like that because I have, I have emotions and I also have a deep religion. So it's hard for me to answer that. But I think it, that people have, that people will have to die that way before this world finally finds peace. And maybe worse from diseases that are plagued from all kinds of horrible things that can happen that they're working on, even now. So, uh, it's just what it was. It was war. Mr. Cleaver, Mr. Walton? I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, unconditional <laughs> surrender was signed in Europe in May 1945. Mm -hmm. And I was stationed at Schofield Barracks was taking general training for invading some islands. And uh, <clears throat> the Japanese were asked to surrender, unconditional surrender, and they did not respond. And the American forces dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And they were ask again to re to <coughs> unconditional surrender, which they, they didn't. And three days later, dropped the next atomic bomb on Nagasaki. And three days after that, they agreed to unconditional surrender, the 15th of, of August, 1945. And the, the peace treaty was signed, uh, unconditional surrender was signed in September aboard the battleship Missouri, which was one of the ships that was sunk <coughs> in Pearl Harbor. And incidentally, the Missouri was named after the state of the president. Truman was president. Mm -hmm. And uh, the unconditional surrender was assigned aboard the uh, battleship Missouri. And supposedly, a lot of lives were saved, American lives were saved because at the, for the, the lives of those killed by the atomic bomb, the American lives were saved because uh, the, the thought was that the Japanese were suicidal and it would have been a terrible thing to try to go and occupy the Japanese homeland. So that, 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 uh, uh, you, you, you have questions of whether it was to the benefit of, of, of all of this aspect. <clears throat> when I was in the middle of the Pacific, when I dropped the first bomb, which was August the 6th. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, since you were at war, when you wrote even a letter, they would examine it to see if you had any pertinent information about the law. So they would uh, uh, review it carefully. So we didn't have any information about the bomb being dropped. The only thing I remember going to a museum later on is that I was part of the fleet that was going to invade Japan. So, if you would ask me if we needed to drop the bomb, I said, yeah, drop it through, yes. Because the Japanese would not surrender. And they were asked to. And it was, uh, it was terrible for the people that were prisoners of the Philippines. Uh, they would assemble all of them and, and would take one or two out of the 
prisoners and shoot kneecaps off, the legs off, or even kill them. I met someone that uh, was a prisoner of war, and he had his two kneecaps and his arm shot. Where he used to bowl, he couldn't bowl anymore. So when you ask me, do I feel like it was necessary? Yes. 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 And I think if you add up uh, in the imaginary amount of soldiers that would be killed in the invasion versus what was killed in Japan in the bomb, with the bomb, I don't think you can draw a comparison. You know war is terrible. You're going to shoot me or I'm going to shoot you, plain and simple. No other way. Right. There's no in-between. <clears throat> You hear a lot about PTSD. My husband fought Okinawa every night for 50 years. Mm. I have been through that so many times. I feel that I have been to Okinawa. It's not a funny thing. It's a horrible thing. My husband had been a prisoner of war in Germany. Had he been a war in Japan? <coughs> horrible disfiguration, horrible death was come. The Japanese death was nothing to them at that time. And to think that I was reading the paper about the, how they would treat the prisoners was against, against all treaties that were ever been signed. They never signed any treaties doing better than what they were doing. It's sad, boy, it's sad. But we have larger, we have larger bombs than the, than the um, atomic bomb now. They can do much more. Any other questions? Yeah, I could go. When you got back, did you have <laughs> anger in your heart to the Japanese people living here? How and how long did it take to get over that? Ma'am, I don't judge races. I love people. I don't like a behavior. I learned to separate behavior from love. It took me quite a long time to do that. Example, if I may. My daughter went to a and &M. she got involved with the wrong type of people, she started using marijuana, then she got into hard drugs. And she had been sent to I don't know how many places to get the cure. And I felt like when I'd see her, I'd think, God, I hate you. But you know what? You don't hate a granddaughter. You just hate the behavior. But it took me forever. I guess I'm just a slow learner, but <laughs> she's okay now. And um, thank God I changed my attitude, and by changing my attitude, changing about her behavior, her behavior changed. Well, we're being out in Hawaii, <coughs> and Hawaii folks turned out for her Hawaii. We were there for the 50th anniversary. We saw the, the disfigurement and the life that people led on the island, the rest of people that were there. Had Japan launched their third wave without knowing that the aircraft carriers had not been in port. Do you actually feel that they would have actually made California? I think they would made it as far as they could go. And I think, yes sir. I think they did one, sir. I think there are other countries right now, I'll just go ahead and say it, may as well. I think there are other countries that would be more than happy to drop one over here. Absolutely. That's true. Our guests are going to stay a little bit longer to visit, and we've got punch and cookies and coffee and everything. This is, this is a special day that we have here every year. Every day is a special day at the one stop, and the reason I feel it's special is that 
we have so many organizations that are really taking care of our, our current veterans, and they need that. You know, the VA alone can't do what we do. What I think that this makes a point to me is that we still have these stories. We still have these things we need to say. We still have these things that we need to get off our chest. You know, Miss Mangum, when I first came here, she told me about her husband continuing to fight the war every night. And it's why I think that there should be one stops everywhere. Not just okay. here, all over Texas, all over the nation, because all of us still have healing to do. You know, from our, from our veteran under the bridge all the way to the top, you know. We're family. I look out there and y'all are all family. When you're part of the my husband served 25 years. My dad was a combat vet. My son, which is the most handsome cadet in Texas A&M. Can I get a little look, Doc Anderson? Um, um, we got to take care of the veterans that were, the veterans that are com that are serving now, and the future. So when you walk away from here, you see history. But it should also motivate us to know that we have so much more to do. In your generation, there's so much more to do. Because war, unfortunately, is part of life. So, can I say this one more thing? We all came from the same source. We were created by the same source. That makes us all brothers and sisters. But you may not like my behavior. I may not like your behavior. back here, married, had their families, built a nation, built the best nation, as you say, the best nation on God's earth. Amen. After Amen. they went through all that. So we yes, really you. appreciate what y'all do. Mm -hmm. may, I, may I have something to say? Yes. I'm going to stand up for you. Okay, Miss Weaver. <laughs> you say it. This could not happen without volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to tell you how I became one. My husband received good care at the VA. And I told him, I said, what could I do to pay back the care that you have done, have gotten? I retired, I was an art teacher. I went out there and I said, what can I do? And they said, well, create your own program. So I did. Meanwhile, I have puppies and cats and things and I go to a veterinarian here in Waco who talks to me every time I go to him. <laughs> He's supporting everything about what you're doing. We had long conversations, not about education, but it was about how about veterans. And I want to let you know that he is a doll. <laughs> <laughs> There, that, that is one of our new volunteers, and I'm sure he has a few stories to tell too. But it just goes to show that you don't ever know, you know, what you still have to do. We say on the back of our T-shirts, and that's that's my favorite thing, is it says "Thank you for your service," and that's very true. But I think that the words after that mean even more. We still need you. Yeah. We this still need. You have a uniform on that joint. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy these treasures in front of us enjoy each other I uh, I am the richest woman in the world because I get to do this all day every day and love all of these amazing people love all of you so thank you for being here today enjoy them have some punch and cookies and until next year all right, all right. I'm here on Monday and you're not.
No, no, I come Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Well, if you come Wednesday, you come here.